Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis, the 21st chapter. Let us listen for God's word to us today. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt.
we do want to express our appreciation to the choir for all their gift of music this past year and wish them well as they go on their summer hiatus and vacation and um, with special music being provided through the summer. So we're grateful to the choir for their gifts to us. Our second lesson comes from Romans, the sixth chapter, beginning at the first verse. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in the Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. May God bless to our understanding this, the reading of God's word. And to God's name be all praise and glory now and forever. Amen. Today we continue our look at the story, the, the saga of Abraham and Sarah. Three religious communities in the world today lay claim to Abraham and Sarah as their spiritual ancestors. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. All revere this ancient couple and see in them one of the ways that God made God's presence known in our world. Their saga takes up a considerable portion of the book of Genesis and is the focus of the lectionary passages at this time of the church year. <coughs> Last week we looked at the birth of their son Isaac, born when both Sarah and Abraham were well beyond childbearing age. Next week, we'll try to wrap our heads around the command of God to Abraham that he sacrifice this son of his old age. And in future weeks, we'll celebrate the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah, and we'll see the implications for the future of Abraham's clan with his grandchildren, Esau and Jacob. Today, we wrestle with the story of Hagar Sarah's slave, and her son by Abraham, Ishmael. This story of Hagar and Ishmael is one that's often overlooked when we talk about Abraham and Sarah. It's a, a difficult story because it shows that many of our biblical characters are flawed human beings, and that, that makes us uncomfortable. We prefer our biblical characters to be different from us, better than us, more righteous than us. Their flaws remind us of our own shortcomings and the shortcomings of those around us. We also may want to skip over this story because we're just not sure what it tells us about God's promise to Abraham and Sarah and how that promise unfolded in the history of Israel. The story also seems to raise some questions about how God works in the lives of his people. So in many ways, this, this story of Hagar and Ishmael seems like a side story, a tangent, a distraction. Hagar is an Egyptian and she's a slave. She was either 
captured in a raid or sold into slavery by her family and purchased on the slave market. She is Sarah's personal slave and attends to her every need. And like many personal slaves, over the years of service, she becomes close to her mistress, and her mistress becomes close to her. They both share pain as the years pass, and Sarah is unable to bear Abraham a child. Remember that when God called Abraham and Sarah to give up their home and travel to this new land that God was pointing them towards, God promised to make of them a new nation. A covenant, an agreement was made. I will be your God if you will be my people. They traveled to that new land. They settled it. But as the years passed, Sarah was increasingly despondent because she was barren. Now, Abraham was a loving husband and faithful, and he did not, as was the custom of the day, choose to take a second or a third or even a fourth wife. He, like Sarah, waited for the promise of God to be fulfilled to them. Finally, the story goes, Sarah knew that she could no longer have children. And so that Abraham would have an heir so that all that they possessed would be passed along. She conceives the idea of giving Abraham her slave woman, Hagar. And so Hagar becomes Abraham's second wife. And most, almost immediately, she becomes pregnant. And rather having joy, Sarah becomes despondent. She regrets her decision. Hagar's pregnancy is like a, a knife in her heart. She's jealous. She's envious. She knows now that Hagar carries the child of Abraham, and this will bring Hagar into greater status in the home and in the community. Like many of us, Sarah had a hand in creating a situation that she now finds almost intolerable. It's hard to deal with. She finds herself losing control of her household, her life, her very relationship with Abraham. And that makes this very, very painful. As the first wife, Sarah makes life miserable for the pregnant Hagar. She does everything she can to make her daily life a hell. And Hagar has enough and she runs away. But God speaks to Hagar as she's running and he calls upon her to return to return and be obedient to Sarah. And God promises Hagar, I will make of your child a great nation. You know, the story of Hagar and Abraham and Sarah takes on the form of a good old fashioned soap opera. Hagar is, gives birth and she names her child Ishmael or God hears, God hears. Sometime later, Sarah, as we heard last week, gives birth to her son, to Isaac, the child of her old age. And when Isaac is weaned, which was a sign in the culture of the day that the child probably would survive infancy, Sarah again feels jealousy and envy and hate welling up in her heart. She doesn't want Ishmael to share in the inheritance Abraham had collected. And her reaction says a lot about the human tendency to both accept a gift from God and then act like somehow it's ours alone and we need to defend and protect it at all costs, even at the cost of other people. She claimed special status, and she turns it on towards Hagar with words and actions of oppression and hate. She demands that Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael 
away in the desert, probably to their deaths. Abraham is conflicted. He's not sure he wants to do this. But God speaks to him and says that he should do what Sarah asks, because indeed a great nation will come from Isaac, but one will also come from Ishmael. And so Abraham gives Hagar a a little bit of food, a little bit of water, and turns them out into the wilderness, into the desert. Well, as the section of scripture told us this morning, soon the water and the food are gone. They've not found a well, nor an inhabited place to live. And soon Hagar loses hope. Her son is crying for the lack of food and water and her mother's heart is about to break. So out of hopelessness, out of resignation, she puts the baby under a bush, walks away about a bow shot away and sits down, now out of earshot, but waiting for both to die. And she cries. And so the story goes, God hears the cry of Hagar and Ishmael and sends an angel and reaffirms God's promise to make a great nation of the boy and life-giving water is found. Today, the followers of Islam look to Ishmael as their ancestor, the father of the Arab people. The story of Hagar and Ishmael, like the story of Abraham and Sarah, is one of God's promises made and God's fulfillment of those promises. Two great nations were born. Both looked to Abraham as their father. Promises made, promises kept. It's ironic that in this story, God hears the cry of an Egyptian slave and her son who were oppressed by a Hebrew landowner and sent an angel to save her. Generations later in the saga of the Hebrew people, those people would cry to God out of their slavery in Egypt, oppressed by Egyptians, and God would send a savior, Moses, to free them from their captivity. Both the story of Hagar and Ishmael and the story of Moses and the freedom of the people of Israel shows that God hears the cries of God's people. That God is indeed the God of the weak and the oppressed as well as the strong and the free. This part of the saga of Abraham and Sarah emphasizes the trust to which God called Abraham and Hagar and which the trust to which God also calls us to have. For God hears and sees all the circumstances of our lives, the good times and the bad. And that hearing and seeing a basis of trust can emerge. Trust that God will work in ways that are initially hid from us. Trust that God sees what often we cannot see. And trust that comes from the fact that God enables us to see what is beyond our sight. This is the promise of God. And it is kept. Amen.